Our Old Covenant reading uh, this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 7. I think from the uh, prep- preparation for worship, you'll kind of see how this fits together. This is concerning Noah's flood, and I'll be reading verses 13 through 24 of Genesis chapter 7. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, and of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female, and all of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The water increased and lifted up the ark, and it, uh, uh, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air, they were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive, and the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. And our New Testament reading comes first from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 29 through 34. Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in, in which you by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness, and do not sin, for some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the reminder that it is there to correct us and to rebuke us and to encourage us and to build us up. And so we pray that you would pour out your spirit and give us all ears to hear and hearts to believe and eyes to see the truth of the gospel found in your word and that you would use it to mold us and shape us into the image of your son. Fill me with the spirit, Father. Help me preach the text faithfully. Help me preach the truths of the gospel faithfully and give us all ears to hear that we may believe. It is in your son's holy, precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. If you recall, Paul has been writing to the Corinthians in order to correct them in their errant views of the resurrection. There were false teachers saying things things about the resurrection that just were not true. First, they were saying that Jesus had not been truly raised from the dead. And secondly, they were saying that there were no resurrections for for those who were in Christ Jesus. So you've got two major errors of the faith being confronted by Paul. Paul started by reminding the Corinthians that there were more than 500 witnesses to the risen Savior. And that he wanted them to see that even if they wanted to send a delegation to Jerusalem at that time, many of them were still alive. They could gather up a group of people if they wanted and say, go to Jerusalem and let's talk to these people who have seen the risen Savior because they were still there. He also then began a discourse on showing the absurdity of being a Christian if there was no final resurrection. He made the point of saying, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. 
then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Paul then tells them of the reality of the resurrection. After going through this discourse on these verses through 12 through 19, showing them the the absurdity of saying there is no resurrection, it's like he can no longer hold back. And he bursts forth and says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. Yet, he was not done. He was not done making his point that the, of the absurdity of saying that Christ is not risen. So he comes back for, to the subject after showing this magnificent truth of how Christ is risen. He has ascended. He will return. He is dealing with all of his enemies and the last one will be death. And then he comes back and he says, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise again? He's returning to the subject once again. He's saying very simply, look, If there is no resurrection from the dead, and we know that he's coming back to this because he'll say that again. He'll say it in verse 32. Why don't we just let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die? If there's no resurrection from the dead, we might as well live as pagans. Yet in the process of coming back to the topic, Paul brings up another subject. A subject that most of us probably haven't given much thought of. I mean, we've heard of it. What is the subject? Well, being baptized for the dead. What does this mean? Is this even a possibility? Is it something that we should be doing as the modern church? Let me just give you the quick, short answer to that last question. No, we shouldn't. This is not something the church overlooked in our maturity, and I hope you will see this once we get through this this morning. In being baptized for the dead, what were the Corinthians doing? What were they saying? What did it mean? Well, there are two theories to this. Since Paul doesn't explain it, we've had to kind of put pick pieces together. And the, the first theory, theory of the, being baptized for the dead was that the Corinthians were baptizing believers who, uh, being baptized for believers who died before they had the opportunity to be baptized. In other words, they were saying, look, this guy came to know faith. He was a true believer, but he didn't have the opportunity to, to be baptized. He died, so we need to get Mark to come and be baptized on his behalf. Okay, that, That's one of the possibilities that was being put forth. But we know that this cannot be true. Because while baptism saves, as we will see, it's not something that we look for in a few moments uh, or that we will look for that in a few moments, but salvation is not dependent upon us being baptized. The one who believes must be absolutely baptized, must not, the one who believes doesn't absolutely have to be baptized in order to go to to heaven. And I I know that some of y'all, your minds have already gone to this. To who? To the thief on the cross. Remember the thief on the cross is next to Jesus and they're talking back and forth. And and at this moment, in that great confession of faith, you know, he turns to the Lord, this thief turns to the Lord and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Wait, no, we don't think about that as a confession of faith, do we? But it is. He is confessing truths in that moment, in that short sentence of his. He believed that Jesus to be Lord, to be Lord over all things. There was no confusion for him whether Caesar was Lord or Jesus was Lord. It was clear to him that that Jesus was the true Lord over all creation. He believed that Jesus would come into a kingdom. And by that, we know that he believed in a resurrection. He believed that there would be a resurrection. All of these things are said in that quick, short sentence. And Jesus responded with the most precious words the dying thief could hear. Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, he didn't need to be baptized. But baptism is still important. What does our confession say? Although it be a great sin to contemn or neglect this ordinance, yet grace and salvation are not so inseparably annexed unto it as that no person can be regenerated or saved without it, or that all 
that are baptized are undoubtedly regenerated. So our confession comes forth and says that, look, you don't have to be baptized. All right? That you can still be saved and not be baptized. But it also turns right around and says, just because you're baptized doesn't mean you're regenerated. So, so that's what one thing, one view that they were taking, uh, uh, understanding of what it meant that those who were being baptized for the dead, what did it mean? Well, some believe that they were being baptized for those who had died without baptism. Again, if that were the case, then the thief would have had to been, somebody would have had to die or been baptized for that. And I'm quite certain that Luke would have pointed that out. Okay? The second way that this being baptized for the dead is understood is that there were those who were believers that didn't want to immediately get baptized because they wanted to save that baptism right before their death. They wanted to make sure that they were cleansed of all their sins, okay, all of their sins before they went to see Christ, before they stood in judgment. So they were waiting for the very last moment, okay? I, I kind of wonder if this is not some of the reasoning and thinking behind last rites among Roman Catholics, but I don't know that well enough, and I should have looked it up. But they wanted to make sure the very last moment that something takes place and that they're baptized and all their sins are taken are, are paid for. Now let me just throw this word out to you and I didn't write it down in here so I'll probably get it wrong. But this is a view or an idea of sacerdotalism. Sacerdotalism is, it has two different aspects of it. One, of, one aspect of it is that in, in sac, those who are sacerdotalists and sacer comes from the Latin word that means priest mean that the priest have some special power that they can uh, do certain things to you. They can anoint you and do all of these things. And so they have more power than they're actually given. But sacerdotalism, when it comes to the sacraments, mean that the sacraments have more power than they should. All right? And so in a sense, they were believing in a sacerdotal view of baptism, that it was able to truly cleanse and wash of sins. I think the more reality of what is taking place, um, this second view, is that this is more of a reality of what's taking place because of what Paul writes later on. He says, awake to righteousness and do not sin. You see, if we take that view that we can be baptized right before we, we're, we die, then we can live any way we want, even though we're Christians, and, and then it'll be taken care of with our baptism there at the end of our lives. Well, that's that doesn't work that way. And Paul kind of acknowledges that when he says, look, awake to righteousness and do not sin. That's the answer. Go ahead and be baptized. So why wait? Okay? Now this view of saving baptism to the end is false because of the way baptism is presented to us. Once a person believes they are baptized and if they have not, if they have not already been baptized, remember Peter's sermon. That's the best example. Okay? Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, he's preaching to them, and the men say, what must we do? What is it that he says? Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Apparently, the Corinthians failed to understand what took place on Pentecost. And what the proclamation of the gospel demanded. The gospel, you know, calls us the moment that we believe it is to be baptized immediately because of what baptism is. Peter didn't tell them to wait. They were to be baptized at that moment, and they baptized thousands that day. You know, this is what we do with baptism. It's one of two sacraments, and it's there for a reason. It's given to us to set us apart. It's given to us to mark us as something different. And it's given to us to remind us that in our faith we have been cleansed. It's given to us to show that the outward washing is a reality of the inward washing that takes place when we're given the Holy Spirit. Doug Wilson helps us here when he talks about understanding baptism, when he talks about sacraments. He's talking about both the Lord's Supper and baptism. But it helps us. He says a sacrament is a sign and a sign that seals what it signifies. Okay? It's a sign that actually seal, seals what it signifies. He go, And he writes on, he says, this is not a front operation. 
The sacra sacrament of the Christian religion, therefore, the sacraments of the Christian re religion, therefore, are those which signify and seal the covenant of grace. We know that a practice is such a sacrament if it was instituted by God in order to represent Christ and his salvation. Don't we always say that when we're talking about the Lord's Supper? It does. It represents Christ. It represents the gospel to us, but it also represents our salvation. He continues, A sacrament is placed upon a particular individual in order to establish a link between the promise of the covenant and that person. Notice he Notice that. He says, an individual. So I can't be baptized for you. And I shouldn't wait to be baptized. A sacrament is also given as a means of distinguishing the saints of God from those who are not. To put a visible difference between the church and the rest of the world. Okay? We need to recognize that we are to be different. And one of the ways that we're shown to be different is to be baptized. It is to be baptized. Now, when God places the visible difference before us, are we not obligated to see it? As a result, those who are set, uh, with a such divine mark upon them are obligated by it. So Wilson is making the point that some, and this is where he gets accused of being a sacerdotalist, is because he's saying that we come to baptism and then, and then by being baptized, all right, it obligates us to the promises of it. Well, it does, okay? The Corinthians failed to understand one of the main purposes of the, of the point of baptism. It sets us apart for Christ. Allow me one more quote from Wilson. The signification of baptism is twofold, that it points in two directions. The first is the solemn recognition that the one baptized has been admitted into the historical church of Christ. Okay, so we're saying if somebody's been bapti baptized, and it doesn't matter what they, how they're living. If they've been baptized, they are a part of the church of Christ. Okay? All right? So let's go on. It says, at the same time, the baptism also points away from the person to the objective meanings of baptism. Baptism means that the one bapti baptized has a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, has been grafted into Christ, has the sign and seal of regeneration, and forgiveness of sins, and has the obligation to walk in the newness of life. He has the obligation. We are obligated to that. Now, it makes you think about the people you know who have been baptized and walked away from the faith. They still have the obligation placed upon them to live a godly life, and they will be held accountable on Judgment Day. I hope that you're getting a clear understanding of what baptism is from all of this. It is very much like the words... I do. Y'all know the word I do? Y'all all a lot of y'all have said it. I do or I will. Okay? You stood there before God and a pastor and the congregation and you took vows among each other and they said, "Do you take?" and you said, "I do." Now let's think about that for a minute. How many times have you said I do in your life and it didn't have that sign significant impact upon your life? Okay? You say I do all the time. All right? All right, do you like this movie? I do. Do you like this? I do. Do you like this? I don't, you know, or I don't maybe, but I do. Okay, you say it all the time. But it was at that moment that you stood before God with the pastor and the congregation all around you and you took vows and you said the words, I do, that something in your life changed. You went from being single to married. You went from being one to two who are one flesh. Okay, all of these things took place and changed. The words you uttered had no power in them, but it was the situation and what they signified that made, made them powerful. Okay? The question is, when a man takes those words and says, I do, will he be a faithful husband or an unfaithful husband? Either way, and here's the point, either way, he's still a husband. Doesn't matter how he acts, he's still a husband, whether he's faithful or not. The same is true with baptism. The man who becomes baptized uh, uh, is a Christian. The question is whether he will be faithful or unfaithful. So, so far what we've seen is that there are two possibilities for the meaning of the term baptized for the dead. The first was that, there, that it was used for believers who died, who had not yet been baptized. 
If baptism was absolutely necessary for salvation, then we would have someone baptized for the thief on the cross. It would be shown out. Luke would have dutifully recorded that, that so-and-so came along and was done that, if it was absolutely essential. But we know it's not. The second view of being baptized for the dead is that there were those who were who believed uh, in the, it was a final washing before their death in order to get ready for judgment day or heaven or to stand before the Lord, whatever it is, however they viewed it. Now let's talk about the errors of these two positions. I'd like to focus on the error of the practice to help us understand where it was that the Corinthians had gone wrong. The first error, if they were actually baptized for those who died, was simply placing too much emphasis on the corporate nature of the church. I won't spend a lot of time on this since we suffer from the opposite. We suffer from hyper-individualism of the church. We, we fail when it comes to the understanding that we are corporate in nature. They went too far and thought that, well, since, you know, since uh, we are all part of one body, I can be baptized for someone who didn't do that. But, but you know, um, so I hope you can see kind of the foolishness of the first part. We cannot believe for another person. We cannot be baptized for another person. But the, the, but the sign of the covenant, and the covenant is relational in nature, so we know and understand that it, it goes to everybody that's in there individually. Both sacraments are covenantal and relational in nature, and they are given to us by God and applied to us as individuals, but we are made a part of the corporate body when we take those on. The second error that the Corinthians were making, and I believe they were putting off their baptisms until right before their death, this is the one that I think was showing what it was, is the belief in the power of baptism itself. Again, this is sacerdotalism. There is no power in the sacrament themselves, but there is power in that which the sacrament is identified with. In other words, the power comes from that which is signified, not that which signifies. Do you, you hear the difference there? It's not that which is signified. Uh, uh, I mean, it's not that that signifies that has the power. It's that which is it's signified. In other words, what is it pointing to? Okay? It, it, again, I've used this illustration before. You're, you're driving along. You're hungry. You're desperate. You're out in the middle of nowhere, and you have your options between Subway and the Golden Arches. Okay? You know what the Golden Arches represent. All right? They signify something else. They signify plastic-tasting burgers and French fries that are too hot to eat for at least a week. You know, they, they, they signify all of these things, all right? But you don't stop at the Golden Arches. You go inside and you waste your money on something that's going to kill you. That's, I'm sorry. <laughs> I had my first McDonald's bur burger with my boy lat while we were on vacation, and I just remembered how bad they really are. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and mature you through this. <laughs> It's not the sign that has the power. It's not the arches in that illustration that has the power to kill you. <laughs> it's what the sign points to, okay? Um, and what am I quoting here? I can't, I can't remember it. But it says, baptism is a sac... Oh, I'm quoting the confession of faith. How about that? What a, what a novel idea. Let's quote the Confession of Faith. Baptism is the sacrament of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, not only for the solemn admission of the party baptized into the visible church, but also to be unto him, and this is the key points here, a sign and seal of the covenant of grace, of his ingrafting into Christ, which is union. Oftentimes we talk about it as union with Christ. Of regeneration of remission of sins, of his giving unto us God through Jesus Christ to walk in newness of life, which sacrament is by Christ's own appointment to be continued in his church with until the end of the world, okay? Now, here's the accusation that's made against a lot of people in uh, the CREC. We're, we're saying, they, they accuse us that we're saying that baptism provides regeneration and we're not it does not regenerate anybody nobody's saying that even though that's what they accuse us of but the reason that baptism has the power is because it points us to the resurrection itself the true power of baptism comes from the death burial and resurrection of Christ okay 
It is why Paul can write in Romans 1, 16 and 17 the, about the power of the gospel. He says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So what are, what are we trying to say here? Okay. The scriptures talk of baptism that saves, and we're going to look at that verse here in a minute, and baptism that has the remission of sins. How is it that this sign can do that? Well, it's very similar, and we're going to talk about this too, it's also similar to preaching. All of these things, these means of grace, have power, not in of themselves, because of, but what they point to and what they are signifying. Okay, So let's ask the question, and I was asked after quoting Wilson on Facebook once, I was asked by uh, a, a lady y'all, so many of y'all know, and it was a good question, uh, Michelle Shaver, she just said, is, is baptism salvific? Okay, well, I didn't answer because I wanted to think about this for a while, and it's Facebook being Facebook, you got to be careful. She might have heard my answer. I, I expect she would have. But in reality, there's so many people who just start attacking, and I don't want to get into the Facebook war. So I thought about, you know, this is my answer. Does it save? Okay? All right? Short answer, yes. Baptism saves. How do we know? Peter tells us. For, also, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, okay? He's giving us the gospel. Peter's reminding us of the gospel, the richness of it. Who are the, who are the just in this room, okay? None of us, okay? It's Christ the just for the unjust, all right? We are the unjust, and he saves us in order that he could bring us or bring you to God, but being, being put to, to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So that's regeneration, and then Peter continues on and he goes, in which also he went and proclaimed to the spirits of prison. Okay, uh, We could talk about that. Uh, I've, I've preached this section several times in my pastoral career and I think I've preached three different views on that and thinking it was right every time. So I'm not real sure what the spirits in prison are, um, but we can talk about that later. And then he goes on, who were formerly disobedient. And this is Peter. What is he trying to do? He's trying to show us that one, the power of the gospel, and two, the efficacy of baptism. He says, who were formerly disobedient when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah while an ark was being constructed in which a few, that is eight souls, were rescued through water. What's he doing? He's using Noah and the ark as an example of baptism. All right? We can call that Noah's baptism. He continues on. He says, also corresponding to this, or some of your, or some texts say, for that was, it, for this is an anti-type. All right, Noah's baptism was the type. Our baptism is an anti-type. Baptism now saves you. Okay, those are Peter's words. Now saves you. Okay, not removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resur resur resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven with angels and authorities and powers, having been subjected to him. Now again, there's a lot here, and I just want to focus on the important things here. Uh, what I want you to see is the comparison of Noah's Ark and our baptism. This is Peter's way of showing us, again, the efficacy of our baptism that it's not just we're not just being we're just not just getting wet there's more to it taking place in other words he uh, he is debunking that notion that when somebody and this is the accusation that that, that made it is made it's called the reductionistic view of protestants view of baptism they're reducing baptism to its basic simple and saying that when when a baptism occurs somebody gets wet all right and that's what they believe. There are many Protestants who believe that. But that's wrong because there's more to it. Robert Godfrey writes, but to protect the importance of faith, we do not have to deny his presence. Now, Robert Godfrey is coming at it from a different view, but he still shows us that there's more to baptism than just getting wet. He goes on and he says, let me start over. He says, but to protect the importance of faith, we do not have to deny his presence which is what many people in opposition to formalism want to do. They say, no, we don't want to find Christ in the water. We want to find him just by faith. 
they're so tied to justification by faith alone and Christ alone that that's all they can see. And they don't see it in the fullness of Scripture that calls for sanctification and calls for obedience and calls for all these other things. So they want to say, just by faith alone. But Godfrey continues, he says, but Luther and Calvin's point is that the water bears Christ to us. Does baptism relate to regeneration? Sure it does. When we look in faith, and that's the key, when we look in faith to our baptism, we, we are sure we are regenerate. Okay? All right? When we look to faith in, to our baptism, we know we are saved. So the example that Peter gives us is making the point is that Noah and his family, who were truly saved through the water from the wrath of God, is an example of our baptism. Peter's showing us the reality of Noah's baptism. All eight members of his family were baptized. Noah's baptism, again, was a type of baptism. Ours is the antitype. Now, the question is, was it salvific? Okay. Yes, all eight were temporarily saved. But only those who believe had the efficacy of baptism applied to them for eternal salvation. Okay? So there's some sense in which someone who is baptized is in the body of Christ as if, as if they were in, the, in Noah's ark. Okay? In some sense, they are saved. We don't know how. I can't. I, you know, maybe I need to expand on that or think about that a minute. But it's it's a picture of what's taking place. All eight were saved, but we know that not all eight were believers. We know that. Okay. We know from what happened afterwards. But only those who were believed had the actual baptism applied effectually to them, so that they had eternal salvation. Okay. Now Peter is also showing that not only. Is our not only were they saved, and baptism saves, but that our baptism is actually better than baptism under the old covenant, because under the old covenant only those uh, uh, only the outward flesh could be cleansed, where ours is actually bringing back a clear conscience. There is real efficacy to baptism because it leads to the good conscience rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, this is how baptism saves us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or we could put it this way. Through baptism that is given in faith, by faith, with the power of the Holy Spirit, the efficacy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is applied to the one baptized. And God used baptism as a part of a means of grace to bring about that salvation to that person. Baptism is simply, again, the means of grace that the Lord has chosen to use to apply the gospel of salvation. What's the means of grace that was applied to most of us? The preaching of the Word of God. That's a means of grace, all right? So the reason that we can have a clean conscience is because of the gospel and because Christ has died once for all, the just for the unjust, baptism therefore cleanses our conscience while the sacrifices of the Old Testament could only cleanse the body or the flesh. I love Hebrews 9, 13 through 14 that makes this point. What, what I'm trying to stress here is that our baptism is far better than the baptisms that were in the Old Testament or the sacraments in the Old Testament. It's less glorious, but it leads to more glory. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the puring, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Okay? we got to remember, people, that when we have been baptized and we believe in Christ and trusting in Him, we should have a clear conscience before God. He's paid all the debts of our sins. We can walk in hope. We can walk with joy. We can serve Him with joy. We don't have to worry about fear of judgment or condemnation. He has dealt with all of that. We are cleansed by these truths through the means of grace. Now again, what are the means of grace? The means of grace are simply the preaching of the Word of God and sacraments of baptism, uh, sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. 
And when, it, when, when, in the end of the, when any of these are done by faith, then salvation come to those who, are believe, who believe and we are cleansed. It is by faith that we are saved, yet God chooses to use these means to bring about that faith. Now notice, again, the passage on preaching that I love to bring up. It's not the preaching itself that saves, but the preaching that the Lord uses to save. Listen to this, okay? This is key. I hope you're beginning to see this. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Or believe in him whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear him without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Okay? So God is using man. He is using godly men to come and preach the gospel. And their preaching is how God uses faithfully preaching the gospel to, to use so that they hear Christ and hear Him and re- redeem them. So God uses means of grace. Now, in view of all that I've said, let's just stop here for a moment. Okay? In everything that we have affirmed, about baptism, do you see any room for anything like baptizing for the dead? Do we see that anywhere in these truths that we know about baptism? This is one of the remarkable things about studying God's truth and and all of the things that He has done. You begin to look at the sacraments and what they mean and the means of grace and how God uses them to bring people to Himself and the foolishness of the false teachers in Corinth quickly fall away. So given that, I, I want to do mind how you go in a different little way here. I want us to say some things to make sure that you understand what we are not saying, okay, about baptism. All right? Since it's such a controversial topic. I mean, just think about this. Here in Corinth, they've already got a controversy over baptism and how old is how old is the church? You know, a couple years old. Uh, Christ has only been risen for some 20 years or so. You know, it's, there it is, and they've already... And yet we still have controversy about baptism. So given that, I want us to, to go over a few more things so you understand what we believe about de- baptism and what we don't believe. First, a quote, another quote from Doug Wilson. Of course, this baptism does not automatically save the one baptized, okay? We recognize that in our confession, Okay? We're not saying that our children are automatically saved when we baptize them. What we are saying is that eventually, through, God, through the means of grace, normal means of grace, normally will bring that our children will grow up and trust in the Lord and the, their baptism will be effectually applied to them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me start the quote over again. Of course, this baptism does not automatically save the one baptized. There is no magical cleansing power in the water. We reject the Roman Catholic notion that saving grace goes in when the water goes on. We deny any ex opere operato efficacy to the waters of baptism. We also deny the modern Protestant reductionism that says that when the water goes on, somebody gets wet. So we're in between those two. Our baptism has meaning. And it is used by God in our lives. It's not just an empty ritual. Okay, It has a real effect in our lives. Now, a few notes here. Things I want you to know. The sacraments do not depend on the godliness of the minister. Okay, This, is, this is, refutes the false notion of sacerdotalism, which I mentioned earlier when it com- comes to the priest. But this was also a great controversy uh, in the early church. I think... Uh, the Donatus controversy. I don't know if you can remember that. But what was going on was the persecution from Rome was so intense that people were, were, were recanting their faith. And so someone would say, well, wait a minute. My pastor who baptized me recanted his faith. Does that mean I have to be baptized over again? Well, that was the controversy. All right, Do I have to be baptized all over again because... He was unfaithful, all right? And the answer is no, okay? Because the power isn't in the minister who does it, all right? The efficacy efficacy comes from the Word of God and from the Spirit of God. So if if you were baptized by somebody who fell away from the faith, you're still baptized, all right? The sacraments also confirm the Word. 
and we're talking capital W there, though they are ineffective without the word, capital W. But the word cannot have its full effect without the sacraments, little w there. This, this refutes the notion that the sacraments are sacerdotal at all, okay? So, and this is why we believe that we don't have the Lord's Supper or we don't have baptism without the preaching of the Word of God. That's one of the fundamental foundations of the Reformed faith is that the preaching of the Word of God takes preeminence over the congregation because it goes to everybody, all right? But these things only go to those who are in the covenant, who have been baptized, okay? So there we go. So what, that's what we're saying there. The sacraments are also covenantal and relational, okay? They're not ethereal or out here. They're not just some high idea. Uh, when, we, when we enter into the covenant, we are entering into the covenant with the person of Christ. And he's entering into the covenant, or he's got, got the covenant, he has us enter in with him. But we're also entering with all those others who have also been baptized. So it is very relational, okay? It's not something that is dis distant. The sacraments are also performative acts. You must do them. It's the I do of our faith. We are taking the steps to do these things, and God uses them in us to, to do things in us, to grow us and to mature us. Baptism admits a person to the covenant community regardless of their faith. Just as a man says, I do, is still a husband in marriage, a person who is baptized is still a part of the community. Sacraments bring both blessings and cursing, curses, and this is where people get upset with Wilson, okay? But I think he's, he's dead on because it is a covenant. Sacraments bring, bring both... And I don't know why they get upset. We read, we, we know that there were people who were abusing the Lord's Supper in Corinth and because of their abuse of it, were dying, okay? So I don't know why they get upset It's saying they bring blessing and curses, but they do, okay? The sacraments bring both blessings and curses just as they did as the sacraments of the Old Covenant. Blessings come to those um, who come to the sacraments in faith and curses to those who don't believe. Okay, so the one who is not truly believing, who's got the name of Christ on him, who's going through all of these things, that's actually bringing a curse on their lives. The non-elect do not receive what the sacraments signify for blessings. Uh, we deny that sacraments automatically save. We deny ex opera operato. We deny polit uh, Protestant reduction re reductionism. And then we also, accept, like we said, we accept that baptism accomplishes something. That is the I do. Okay. Let us close in prayer. Father, we thank you for baptism. We thank you for the sign that it is. We thank you for the clarity that you have given us, given to us on it, even though there are aspects about it that are hard to understand and hard to, to say, uh, given the current culture of Protestant or evangelicalism, we'll put it that way. But we want to be clear about that, that these sacraments do mean things. And they point to great um, realities of the gospel. They point to Christ. And we find Christ in them. So Father, grow our understanding of that. And let us grow as a church as we baptize more and more. And as we serve the Lord's Supper. Father, it's in your Son's holy precious name we pray. Amen.